Hello, everyone. Welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. How's your today is a gloomy day. <laughs> we hope that you are enjoying your day. Thank you for spending your time with us. And from both of us, um, a very, very happy, you know, our best wishes for a very happy and successful, prosperous new year. Yes. We are out of 2020. Yes. Oh my God. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Donnie, is there anyone that you want to give a shout out to from the from the audience? Um, I just want to say hello to everyone and um hello Karen and uh Stephanie and just just welcome. Okay. So we're we're always excited. Every show we're excited. You guys are probably tired of us saying it, but we're really excited this week because we are joined by Yuriba Richin, who is a professor, writer, director, and a former producer with Democracy Now. She has done an amazing uh, documentary about the Green Book, which um, as a documentary, it offers just a real unvarnished look at the history of the travel guide that helps so many African Americans safely navigate John Crow, you know, uh, John Crow era, Jim Crow era America, if I can get my, my terminology correct. Uh, the documentary covers the violence, insults, and dangers Black Americans faced on the road. And it really conveys a remarkable sense of the pride and sense of community um, that our people felt um, in terms of creating safe spaces for themselves and for others. And again, the wonderful achievement that they did is they created these safe spaces and published them in the Green Book all around the country. And that's something that we're going to spend a lot of time about because people think Jim Crow, they just think the South. It was all over America. So hopefully going to raise some awareness on that one today. And really kind of talking about the establishments of Black restaurants, hotels, um, automotive repair places, stores, all that kind of thing, vacation retreats, all of these kind of safe Black spaces that are all around the country, that were all around the country. So without further ado, Yoruba, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Happy New Year to you both. Happy yeah. New Year. Happy New Year. Donya, I'll let you go first this week. If you want okay, so um, yes, I, uh, let me tell you, first and foremost, I was very excited about the entire show. I loved it. I loved everything about it. Um, your commentary, how you were the narrator, the things that you said, you know, what really got me because I, I have my side with me and, and the group knows it. So when you came off and said the flyness of us, I it, I started snapping my fingers. I was like, yes, the flyness. That was, that, 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 that was one of my uh, contributors. That wasn't me, but it's one of my favorite okay, well, lines well, in the film. Said that, I was like, yes, because they stood there and they were taking their picture and everything. And I was like, yes, I see y'all. So, you know, I'm like the flyness. I love it. Um, but the love that we have and, and everything, it was everything that they were saying was very true. Um, but one of the things, one of my main questions was what made you want to do this particular story? So um, basically how this film came about was I was approached by a production company uh, in the UK actually. And um, this was in, gosh, this is probably in like 2017. Um, and it was at a time when the Green Book which a lot of us had never heard of. Uh, some of us have, and some of us had books, but a lot of us didn't. Um, and the Green Book was getting some press because the uh, Schomburg Library in New York City, uh, the preeminent African-American research library had been, putting, uh, had been putting the Green Books online and making it available for people to see. And that had spurred some, um, you know, some articles and some, uh, you know, some writing about the Green Book and what it was. And the production company that um, initially contacted me, they were interested initially in looking at uh, African Americans' uh, experiences on Route 66. And that iconic highway, you know, that we all know through song, 
uh, and, you know, mythology that was actually, you know, a lot of it was not um, not available to African Americans because there were many places that we were not, there are a few places that we could stay, let's put it that way. Um, then it expanded this idea uh, that they had to do it about the Green Book and, um, you know, what was the Green Book? What was its significance? And they were looking for a director. So they, and I was one of the names that, uh, that they, you know, that, that they had uh, come across and they contacted me. And when we started talking, you know, I, as I said, I hadn't, I didn't know what the Green Book was. And I consider myself pretty good on African-American history. <laughs> um, it's, you know, part of the stories that I tell. And the fact that I did not know about this book made me immediately interested in telling the story. And so the fact that I did not know and I wanted to find out more, you know, this was a bu book that was published from 1936 through 1967 um, and was in the hands of so many black people, but yet was something that, you know, a lot of us didn't know about. Um, but also the fact when I started, you know, just started digging in, realizing that the Green Book wasn't just about a book. You know, it wasn't just about a, a travel guide. It was about how we as a people um, created community through these businesses that were listed in the book and um, also sought pleasure and leisure. So it wasn't just about escaping, you know, it just wasn't just about a terroristic society. Of course, that's the reason why it was created because we were living in a terroristic society all across the country. But we also were in pursuit of leisure and pleasure very, very early on and driving um, afforded that. And the places that were the uh, sp vacation spots that were listed in the book afforded that as well. So that was also my intrigue too, that it wasn't just a story of, you know, of escape or, or fear. It was a story of how we created, the Green Book is a story of how we created our own communities um, and built these communities at a time when we were living in, you know, terrorism, uh, of a stark terrorism in this country. Because the thing that really resonated with me and it really made me think about it was that, you know, as Americans, we kind of have grown up with the, the mythology of the American relationship with the automobile, that the automobile represented freedom and travel. And then when you start delving into the Green Book and really what that represents, you realize, well, not every, even though obviously African-Americans were buying cars, black people were buying cars, they didn't, we didn't have the same freedom to drive wherever we wanted, to, to park wherever we wanted as, um, as, as anyone else would have been able to do. And um, I, I had to spend some, I really had to spend some time kind of percolating on that one and, and just letting that thought kind of flow through. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like there's a lot that we don't, people always ask me like, well, why is the Green Book? Like why pe people don't know, you know, many people don't know about it when it was such a you know prevalent thing. And I think that it's something, you know, where oppressed communities, not just African-Americans, but a lot of oppressed communities, we don't like to talk about things that are painful. We don't like to talk about um, our, you know, our family members may not want to talk about the time that they had to, you know, they were forced to go to the bathroom uh, in the, you know, in the road uh, because they couldn't use a, 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 the restroom. Um, you know, so I think that though it was, it's like that kind of, it's like thing where it's like two, it's like a dichotomy where it was very commonplace but also something that was maybe not talked about and that we lost some of that, um, you know, that, that oral history uh, about, you know, about what we had to endure when we, you know, did something as simple as get on the road. And there were parts in the documentary that really made me smile because I kind of like to go back to, to some of the positives that you were talking about. And there were two scenes, one was um, with a woman of a certain age and she's remembering something <laughs> that was decades previous talking about how people dressed and she was like the women turned out looking mm. like you know, looking perfection at the you know the men were really handsome and you know you had interspersed some clips of, of people actually you know dancing and, and how they were dressed and it's the, just it was the resilience and it was just seeing their joy in the moment 
being amongst their own people in a really kind, you know, in a really lovely kind of, you know, lovely atmosphere. I think that was Idlewild. It was Idlewild. Yeah, that, that was that was Idlewild. And you know, we had to really obviously pick and choose the places that we were going to focus on and what we were going to, uh, you know, the stories that we were going to tell. And you know, in fifty-five minutes, it's obviously a limited. You know, version of what we can tell, but there were Idlewild was an amazing spot, and there were many Idlewilds. There were many places like that, um, and you know that's where also many of our performers were performing during that time, during the '40s and '50s, at these black resorts. You know, um, so those places that have a lot, a lot of it has been lost. That again, that history that's been lost. I remember when I went to Idlewild and I saw, you know, some of the markers that they had. And Idlewild was started, um, it was these, these white men started selling parcels of land to uh, Blackwell to do in like the 1910s. And some of the first, um, these very prominent Black people, like uh, the first, uh, I believe he was the first heart surgeon in um, black heart surgeon who practiced at the universe, at, uh, University of Chicago in like 1915 <laughs> was like buying parcels. You know, these other very prominent real estate people from, from Detroit and Chicago. It's a fascinating history, uh, really, really fascinating. And they began selling it to their friends and so on and so on and so on. So it's that, that history to me that gives me chills to think about so much history that we don't know that even though we were again, as I emphasize, in a terror, living uh, from fear of, of white terrorism in sundown towns, like we talked about, we were also heart surgeons and you know buying land and creating towns and communities, um, and that's the history that I think is so beautiful and so important for us to 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 tell, as well as the other stuff. And I guess talking about lost lost history, because really what you're talking about, especially with that last group of people, is that there were segments of the Black American population that had disposable income. And again, that's not something that we've been programmed to think about in terms of Black finances and Black economics. Absolutely. And, from, and that's, that's been from, you know, the time that we were, you know, brought here. You know, we've always had... Uh, upper class, upper middle class segment of our society um, that has, you know, created the, these very vibrant communities. Um, you know, whether it be business, business, you know, business uh, hubs or or places of leisure. And speaking of the sundown towns, let me tell you what made my mouth just kind of go to the mm. ground when. When when it was said that um, at 6 p.m. they would ring a bell to let the people, the black people know that they had so much time to get out of the town. Now, I had heard I had heard about the the fact that, you know, they were telling you don't let the sun come catch you in this town. I had heard about all that. And um, but what I, I did not know that they actually that a bell rung. And, and and I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, they, they actually did these things? I mean, I know, like, I want to talk about, I want to go in depth in, as far as the book is concerned. But right now, we're, we're in, we're talking about all of the different things that we learned in, in this documentary um, and, and what our, our families had to go through. And to learn that they were bringing this bell for, the workers, the laborers, the the domestic people. If you weren't out of that town by that time period, by a certain time period, you were probably gonna get lynched, killed, hung. So, something was gonna happen to you. And that was amazing to me. Like I, I was blown. Because it, was, because it was basically an eight-fold message: we want your labor, but we don't want your bodies. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, you know, that the book that that was, there's a book called Sundown Towns. Uh, uh, I think it's called Sundown Towns. And it really details uh, the Sundown Towns that were all over the country and those kinds of practices that happened uh, with the bell ring, ringing or other ways, you know, sign, signage that said uh, that Black people need to leave by a certain time. Yeah, I mean, this is the stuff that, 
they don't want to talk about it in this country. That's why we're kind of blown away when we discover it's because that history has been, you know, has been buried. Um, and, you know, I think that's part of how we end up with such different sort of experiences and understanding of this country um, because black people and white people, you know, largely, you know, I'm not saying all and everyone, but, you know, have different understandings of, you know, of, of history. Uh -huh. um, and quite frankly, you know, going into today, you know, there needs to be a real re-education of white folks, of understanding what the history, like really like a re-education. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, until that happens, I don't think, you know, I think we're going to see the kind of like craziness that, you know, that we see today. And I just want to say, especially for people who are going to be watching this on demand, is because we're going to get pushback on this this episode. People are going to be, why are you dragging this up? This is ancient history. And I just want to say for the record, I was born in 1966, and I'm old enough to remember, even though I was really young at the time, my father had the Green Book, and we would travel south using the Green Book. I remember reading it in the back of the car, you know, parents trying to keep their kids entertained. Here, read this. Just, just be quiet for 15 minutes. So I remember holding them in my hand, reading them, not understanding why my dad had it, but obviously now as an adult, I do. Um, so that's within my lifetime. So that's not way, way, way back when. I mean, yeah, okay, it's 50 something years ago, but still, it's in within it's within my living memory. It's in, within my living aunts and uncles' living memories. And that's what we also showed in the film. I and mean, the people who we interviewed were, you know, all alive. <laughs> right. And they had, you know, memories of like you of being uh, a kid with their, you know, family traveling and uh, looking at the Green Book. And let, and and um, let me say this, you know, I'm I'm 48 and soon to be 49. But the thing is, is that I can my mom would I can remember my mother, we traveling back and forth to Virginia Beach or whatever. And we pack we pack food. You know, we we had a little cooler in the car and we packed the food. And then no, we didn't have a green book or anything like that. But she packed the food. I can remember mm -hmm. I remember that the packing of the food, you know, and, and all of that being done. And we might not have had to stop on the side because of how the distance, but it was already there. She didn't have to pull over. Right. And we didn't have to stop to get it or or anything like that. Maybe that was something that she remembered doing because my mother is is older than me. Um yeah. so because my mom's older than me, that's you know, that that may be something that a lot older than me. Let me rephrase that. Everybody's mother's older than them, but <laughs> but she's a lot older than me. So those things, it's those types of things that you know that I'm that I, I even remember for myself, then I would have my little Dole fruit bars and, and the ice, you know, a lot of ice because I love Dole fruit bars and she'd have them there and her Pepsis and, and some chicken and some, and that's what you were saying in, in the thing. And I'm like, I remember that. Yeah. And there was, because there were so many places that we could not stop. So you had to make sure your, your children were fed and that you were you know, had the food yeah. and, and that it was easily packed. Fried chicken is something, you know, fried chicken, besides it being delicious, it's something that you can pack easily, you know? Um, pie is something that you can pack, wrap easily. So yeah, those are all traditions that came out of, you know, the fact of us traveling. And I guess the other thing too that I learned, which I thought is so fascinating, of course, is that, you know, the dawn of the automobile um, and the automobile age happened with the with the with the in tandem with uh, the Great Migration, yes, right. Like we like that was, and there were many different ways that Black people traveled from the South to the North: driving, trains, buses. But we were always going back and forth in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, like uh, we had, there's a book called "The Warmth of Other Suns" by Isabel w Wilkerson. I which, have that. It's an amazing book, which really is the mm -hmm. first book that details, you know, the greatest migration uh, that this world has ever, you know, that this country at least has, has ever seen uh, in, a, in a short amount of time. And so that also was, you know, about the dawn. That was also in tandem with the dawn of the, you know, the automobile. So that was a big part of how we, 
you know, of how we moved and how we uh, tried to, you know, to find better lives and better and better, uh, you know, situation for them for ourselves outside of the South. And one of the things Brian and I talked about with the the dawn of the automobile was one of the things that I've realized is how the changing of how we would the labor. So we would go from the field and now we were the labor in the automobile industry because it made a difference. That was how we were doing, you know, we went from the field to the, the trains. We were the the conductors, we were the the waiters on the trains and then, then the automobiles came and now we were those people and so on and so forth. And then after that happened and we get into the early eighties, we're now the construction workers and, Mm -hmm. and things like that. And I, I, I remember that. And it's like, the transition of of us is is amazing, but in the same instance, what did it what did it do to us? And I guess I'm trying to transition into the actual Green Book now, mm-hmm. um, and how the businesses lost everything once the Civil Rights Act came through. Yeah, I found yeah, it fascinating. Yeah, that's one of the most interesting things. Yeah. Right about 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 it, um, but I just wanted to say quickly uh, when you talk about from the fields to the factory, that is why I thought it was so important that we include uh, the Detroit story, right? Because Detroit was really a center where they were, you know, as as I talk about in the film, where they were calling, where literally Henry Ford was working with black ministers in Detroit to get black people from the South to come and work in the factory and to work in those in, in those factories um, and to which helped spur the dawn of the, you know, the height of the automobile age, right? So it's all connected. Um, even though there were places, you know, many places that we could not go and we needed to create our own um, you know, guidebook for that. So it's it's just really, really interconnected in a way that I find uh, fascinating. Mm-hmm. It is. Um, I think in terms of the book, what I really love is the diversity of businesses. And there's something that John and I were talking about this morning on the phone, talking about the, um, looking at who is owning what kinds of businesses and that women owns not just bed and breakfasts, not just <sighs> boarding houses, but hotels. <clears throat> and not even little hotels. I can't remember her name and I can't remember the ad. But, you know, some Alberta of the people, Snacks, baby. Uh, that was it. <laughs> Alberta. You. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that, you know, and that part came, I did not know that at all, that that was going to, you know, at all be part of the film, a distinct part of the film when I started. But at one point when we were just sort of looking through the green book and, you know, trying to understand and we started seeing all these women own businesses. You know, we were like, whoa, this is like a whole thing. Um, I found Alberta, though, through a family friend who um, had met her niece, who we interviewed. And, uh, and you know, when I told her I was working on this, she was like, oh my gosh, I just met somebody whose aunt, you know, had a hotel that was in the, in the Green Book in Missouri. So that, was, you know, some of these connections that I made in the film were just through like family and friend connections, right? Because it's so, uh, as we said, it's ubiqu- ubiquitous, even though, you know, a lot of us don't, don't know the story. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, what you just said, Danya, about the fact that with the passage of the civil rights, and you know, this is, I'm sure you guys have this conversation amongst your friends, like what does inter- what has integration done for us, mm. right? What has been the, the, the sort of part of integration that has, um, you know, that has destroyed our businesses? That has destroyed, you know, communities and, and full on black, you know, black businesses, vacation spots, all of that. That all happened with integration. Um, and, you know, it was an unforeseen consequence. Um, but why? I mean, well, and, and that my whole, my whole issue with that, I feel that that should not happen. I, I, I think, I feel like, why do, why are we so, we as African, and you guys, I need y'all to, you know, I'm going to scroll up, I'm going to go past, because we got a lot of people who's, you know, talking about how they remember 
pulling over, eating, you know, we got a lot of people who's talking about that. So I'm going to scroll past all of that right now, y'all. And I want y'all to really chime in on what I'm getting ready to say. Why is it that we cannot support everything, everyone, everybody? Or Why do we, huh? Support choice. Why can't we support choice? And, and, you know, because the green, this particular documentary, if you have not seen it, you're, you're actually, you're going to see the rise and fall of black people. This is literally what this documentary shows. It shows the rise and fall. And it, and the reason why I say that is because you have black people who are owning hotels. They're owning everything. They're owning everything from hotels to restaurants to um, snack bars, stores, see, um, food food stores, grocery stores. I mean, gas stations. Everything. They're owning everything. Entertainment spots. Everything. Anything you can think of. They they were owning it. They had it. And then, as soon as the Civil Rights Act passed. We left them and we started going. We were like, oh, okay, we don't need you no more. And now we're going to go straight to this. And that was that. Yeah. Why? Why did we do that? Well, I'll just chime in my own, you know, that there's, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's many sort of academic books written about this and um, which there needs to be. But I think one of the things, you know, that we, and this is, you know, this may sound controversial, but we had been taught through the oppression of slavery and Jim Crow, that to be in a white establishment around white people is what our goal was, mm. as opposed to economic power, right? When we have tried to have, and then combined with the fact, when we did have economic power, literally it was, uh, you know, there were, it was, uh, we, we were burned down like uh, in Tulsa and so many other communities uh, when we did create economic power. So it became ingrained in us in some ways that, you know, the way to make it was to uh, be able to, to, to go to the white establishments, not have our own because we couldn't have that. Now, what I do think it, that's happening that's positive, I think we are seeing today much more effort and energy, and energy to supporting black business and finding out, you know, trying to find out where we can put our dollars as black people into black business. So I think that we're coming, you know, on the other side of that, but that's my, that's my thought. Okay. Okay. Cause I have, so Clarissa Walker says, how would you know who owned what? Um, Emily Davis says we have ourselves to blame the thought that theirs was better. And that's kind of like what you just said. Well, can I, can and, I, answer, can I answer that first one before we start? Yeah. So how do you know who owns what? The face standing behind the cash register. Yeah. If it's a black face and a brown face, then it's a black and brown business. If it's white, if it's not a black or a brown face, it's whatever the color face that, that it was. And remember, there were whole, whole blocks where you had the black dentist, the black doctor, the black funeral homeowner, the black grocer. So yeah, because we were in a segregated time. Yeah. Right. You see right. a blue sign saying colored people with an arrow pointing, you knew that was <laughs> There's that. Because oh. a, black, a black business wouldn't have had those kind of signs. Yeah. So. Right. I mean, it's, it was just amazing to me to watch that happen though in the show and I, and, and I was seeing that and, and learning I don't know. History is just amazing. This, this whole thing is just another form of, of history that was left out. Mm -hmm. It was left out of books. Yeah. And yeah. because it was left out of the history books, this does, it, it, it doesn't show, it shows us in a light. And this was something that was said in the documentary as well. It showed middle-class African-Americans going out and doing the same thing that white Americans were doing, wanting to take a vacation, being able to pay the money to take a vacation, mm -hmm. um, you know, wanting to just live life like 
you know, anybody else. I, I often wondered, I wonder, because I have a picture of my grandparents mm -hmm. at a place called Sparrows Beach. I wonder if Sparrows Beach was in, in that particular, in the Green Book, because that's where the Black people went. And when they were talking, and um, I think it was Dr. Stevens, Professor Stevens, he said, this was during a time where the men wore suits and yeah. the tie and the women had on their dresses and everything. And I swear to God, the picture of my grandparents, my grandfather was standing there with a white shirt on and his tie and my grandmother had on a dress, but they were at the beach. Where's Sparrow's Beach? <laughs> Sparrow's Beach, I believe, is in Maryland, but it was in a Maryland. black beach where, where they all were with, with the black people, that's where they went to the beach. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. That's, yeah, that's where they went to the beach. And yeah. and I have that. And I, I put that on because I created a um, I created a page here on Facebook called Today's New Find in Black History because I'm so tired of the same things. So this particular, this is actually streaming on there right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I posted that picture on there. I'll share it with you. If you stay on after the show, I'll share it with you. But cool. um, that particular, and I'll, I'll read it. I'll find out uh, exactly where Sparrow Beach is. But that particular beach was a beach for African Americans mm -hmm. to go and do, you know, the same thing that they were doing at all those other beaches. Totally. And I often wonder if they were, um, if that they could, they could have been for sure, or places that, uh, if there were any hotels in Sparrow Beach, you know, okay. um, that could, they could be listed too. Okay. Okay. One thing that, um, that, because again, the whole documentary is brilliant, but I thought one thing that you did really well, I think our audience would appreciate, is you really, you really kind of bang, you really kind of banged it into the ground that people associate restrictions on travel and Jim Crow with the South, whereas you kept saying it was all across America. And what do yes. you think is a, a constructive, direct way that we can get over this mythology that Jim Crow <laughs> was just limited to the Southern states? Yeah, totally. I mean, it was created by uh, by Victor Green, who was you know in uh, New York and New Jersey. And he created the book because of his uh, challenges that he had in going down to Virginia to visit his wife's family, mm -hmm. um, and in traveling from New York, um, to, to, you know, to 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 Virginia. But he listed the you know initially the places the first one or two first two books I believe were only New York places. So yeah. there were many places in New York City um, that. Uh, African Americans were not welcome. Um, you know, the sort of classic places like the Cotton Club, right? And some of these, and this is in the 30s, some of these jazz, you know, entertaining entertainment spots where Black people uh, could not go. Uh, the only Black people that you saw were on stage and serving, right? I mean, there were restaurants, uh, and this was, uh, so this was, you know, this was, as you said, all over the country. And he expanded from New York to the rest of the country um, and eventually sp expanded to the, throughout the world. Uh, he had uh, green books that uh, had listings in the Caribbean and, and in Europe um, because we needed places to know the places that we were welcome as we were, you know, visiting, working, et cetera. Well, again, I mean, you have state constitutions like um, Oregon. I believe it's either Oregon or Washington State, and I, I'm going to say Oregon. That was Oregon. created as a white homeland. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it was actually in their constitution. Yeah. The benefit of the audience that black people could not live there. That's right. Um, and speaking of black people not living somewhere, Pierce City. I did some research on that one. So just to let you guys know who haven't seen the documentary, Pierce City um, is in the documentary and it was about, uh, it, it had at one point about 300 Black people lived there. And in, the, in there, a white woman was killed. And they snatched this, in, in the documentary, they snatched this one Black man and they pushed him off a balcony and shot him up. 
But when I did the research on it, and then they set fire to five houses because they were saying that the black people, they went into the black neighborhood and they set fire to five of the black houses and basically chased the people out of there. Right. Okay. But when I did the research on it, it, they actually chased out 300 black people and they actually hung all, they hung three men, including the man that they shot up. Mm -hmm. Um, there were only 1,300 people that lived there. 1,000 of them were white. The other 300 were Black. They chased them all out. And from that point on, no Black people lived there because they were saying they were not wanted. I checked to see the population of African Americans in Pierce City, Missouri today. One. Yeah. There is one black person living there today. Right. And according to what I read, the descendants of those that were chased out were supposed to bring lawsuits against the city, mm. but they haven't done it yet mm. because of the property that was lost yeah. and the things that were done. So I'm saying all this to say, how do you, what, what are your thoughts on the reparations of that because that's the reparations thing that without a doubt like there's no question at all that again is a reparations thing because they ran those people straight out and y'all know how i am i don't cut my cars or nothing so with that being said what are your thoughts on reparations for those descendants of those families that were ran out of there because the two men let me the two men that were hung along with Mr. Godley, I think that was his last name, um, they couldn't have had anything to do with the killing of that white woman because they were elderly. They just killed them to be killing them. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting to think about reparations. I mean, if, you know, I'll just first say off that I'm all for repar re reparations. I think they're completely necessary, but with reparations, we have to also understand that history, right? That's what we are saying. Like you can't have reparations or reparations are not possible until people actually understand the history and right. what that loss is. It's interesting, it's interesting to think about going to a sort of more narrow tailored view of reparations where you go to these communities like Pierce City like Tulsa, like Rosewood, like Greenwood, like all these places where we there's documentation of the of how African Americans were run out and their businesses destroyed. Um, you know, I think that's tricky because we know that there was more than what's been documented because this stuff wasn't documented. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly a way to begin to actually really like pinpoint and be specific about how white terrorism um, has, you know, resulted in economic loss, economic, you know, for our people, for these communities. Um, and at least start there to try to understand and figure out, you know, what reparations would, would look like. And again, it's the way that the past just, it doesn't even resonate to today. It is still lived today. That's right, of and course. In terms of, you know, Sandra Bland driving to a job interview, dead. Philander Castile, minding his own business, in his car, dead. The talk that Black parents have mm -hmm. to give their children about what you do to hopefully potentially survive an encounter with the police when you're driving. Yeah. So it resonates back to even my even earlier comment where the autom automobile was meant to represent freedom for all mm -hmm. Americans, not for us. Still, it's, right. it's still not a safe space for us. Oh, and Sparrows Beach, thank you, um, Delma. Sparrows Beach was in Annapolis, and then there was another yeah. one in Annapolis called Cars Beach. Mm -hmm. So both of them were the, the Black beaches the for black African beaches. Americans. Yeah. And those beaches were between, she has it between 1926 and 1974. Mm -hmm. My grandmother died in 1950. My grandfather died in 1964. Mm -hmm. So... Those were the beaches that my grandparents took their children to. Right, right, right. Well, I don't even know how to, how to even start kind of, and I, I hate the word educating because that people just kind of tune out when they hear that word. How do you have a conversation with America, with probably 40% of America that just, just does not 
want to acknowledge that the past is still very much part of today. Like the analogy that I gave you, Sandra Bland not being safe, Philander mm-hmm. Castile, the fact that we have to give our children the talk for an automobile that white Americans just take for granted. I just turn the key, put my foot on the gas, and I just go where I want to go. Well, I think that, again, you know, this is, you know, my own opinion. <laughs> I think that um, one of the things that I think white people need to talk to other white people about it. Um, I think they need to be the, the, the white people who are, uh, you know, and there are lots of white people who are engaged in this kind of work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't want to use the word woke because that's been like demonized and made fun of and, you know, like they always try to do. Um, but white people who are really engaged with this kind of anti-racist work. And I think they need to do that, 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 the, to that 40% or whatever number it is, they need to have those conversations um, and do that re-education. I think it's a re-education, like re-education. Um, that's, you know, I think that's what has to happen. I agree. I think re-education is definitely um, what it is, but you're faced with those that call the re-education uh, revisionist history. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's not, yeah. it's not revisionist history. We're talking about facts, when you, yeah. Right, especially when you can come with the proof of it. When you, yeah. when you come in with receipts, this isn't revisionist, this is the stuff that was left out. And um, how are you calling it revisionist when this is the part that was left out when I'm showing you, yeah, this is the part that you missed. Mm-hmm. So, but um, I'm, I don't know. I mean, you're, this, this particular, like what you were saying, Brian, to answer it, this movie, this documentary in itself is a way to show them, okay, you can't look at this and say, you're right, history doesn't repeat itself because it's still going on. That's Everything right. that was in that particular docu- documentary, it's actually still happening today. Like without any any doubt, these things, there's no way that you cannot look at that documentary and say that this stuff is not still happening today. Well, the fact that on Facebook you have black travel groups where people are asking each other questions, am I am I going to be safe if I visit this place? It's yeah. based on today. Yes. I was talking to to Birdie, to one of our cousins, and she actually said, do we need to start another green book? People always talk about that. She was like, do we need to even start another Mm -hmm. one again? Like, is that something that has to happen again in order for us to be safe again? And, And, oh my God, is that something that actually has to happen again? That would be a repetitive thing. That would make it to be repeating itself. But in the same instance, it's just it's just a continuation. It's not a yeah. it's not a repeat. But you know the irony of this country is the same people that don't want to listen to this conversation. If we did have a revised Green Book, would call it would say, "Oh, they're playing the victim card again." Mm-hmm. You know, you know that that's going to be the response. Okay, well, call me the victim because <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm that one. You can call me a victim. I don't have any problem with that. that yeah, really. Me. I, ever, I just, I don't have any problem with that, but. Um, so you I wanted to get your opinion on this one. We haven't really, you know, the, the Green Book has not been in the kind of American psyche for, for a while, but over the last 18 months, I've noticed on, well, two years actually, I've noticed on television, it keeps popping up more and more often. So you have The Watchmen, the, the TV series on HBO that didn't feature the Green Book, but it was mentioned. You have Lovecraft Country, where the Green Book is may not be front and center, but it, it is an important part of the, the story that that TV series talks about. What do you think is the renaissance behind the Green Book all of a sudden? Well, I think that as I when I started out um, and said that when the Schomburg began uh, putting Green Books online, there the, that uh, began you know a sort of flurry of articles about about what the Green Book is. I think that was starting in about, it must have been about 2015, I think they started it. Um, and so I think that was the beginning of a, you know, re-looking at um, a re-examination and a rediscovery of the Green Book. Now, of course you have the movie that came out, the Hollywood movie, The Green yeah. Book that came out. 
And it happened to come out the same year as my film, uh, which was not intended <laughs> at all. Um, and there was a lot of critique around that film, if you remember, mm. um, for on many different levels. One, you know, so the, some of the most egregious stuff is that uh, the Green Book, was, it's called the Green Book, but, you know, is not, about the Green Book, the Green Book is mentioned like one time and actually mentioned in a way that is kind of dismissive of, uh, of, the, of the book. Um, the, you know, another thing that I think is really, really problematic is that, uh, you know, the, and someone pointed this out that in that film, black hands never touch the Green Book. It's the white driver who yeah. is the one who, ha you know, which is just r ridiculous. Um, and, and of course, the Green Book, the, the Hollywood film is written by, you know, it's all white director, white writer, so uh, from the white perspective. Um, and so a lot of problems with that film, but I do think what it did is that it gave people uh, notice or gave people, um, you know, an idea that, of a, that they had never heard of. So, for example, the film, the hot, that, that film came out when we premiered and we were able to use it and we got a lot of media interest because of the problems with that film. Um, and so it helped with our publicity, in fact, and at least gave people like, oh, okay, Green Book, what is that? And a way to delve deeper. And I think that's what's happening. You know, these, these things often snowball on each other. You know, it comes out in the zeitgeist, then somebody takes it up and puts it, you know, weaves it into, you know, their TV series like Lovecraft. And so I think it's a, a snowball effect. And what do you think is one of the, I guess, I mean, we've spoken about so many different aspects of the, the Green Book series, but what do you think is one of the, the lesser known or maybe lesser appreciated um, aspects of the Green Book? Well, I think it's what I initially said that it's not just about uh, places to go uh, to avoid violence, but that these uh, places were places of community for us. So some of the places listed in the book that we talk about in the film, like Idlewild, like um, A.G. Gaston's hotel uh, and, and motel, these places were big deals for <laughs> us and where we had our entertainers uh, performing Gaston is where the head was the headquarters for MLK for Dr. King uh, during the Birmingham, um, uh, you know, the efforts to integrate Birmingham. These were actually real historical uh, places that house our leaders, you know, some like our top leaders and our entertainers, um, as well as families mm -hmm. who were, um, you know, traveling or, you know, and or looking for vacation spots. So it was it's a it's a kind of banal thing of a guide you know like a motor guide you know we think of like the AAA guide or you know just something that you have in the car but these were real places that really um were important in terms of our of our his our our political um and entertainment history uh and provided a space for many of, the, of these businesses provided a space for black people to go and 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 have you know these these experiences so if i you know going back in the day you know, i'm thinking you know I'm, I'm using the green book but i'm thinking i want to go one step further i actually want to write something for the green book how would someone have gone about actually um volunteering to to actually plot safe routes i mean did you just get in touch with victor hugo green and so what what green did what victor green did is he solicited uh advertisements within the book so he said you know let us excuse me he said let us know you know the these places like send in the information and also police the um, uh post postal people and of course you know the post office was one of the places uh that was very that was open to black um to hiring black people very early so we had a big presence in the postal service they would go to these businesses and say, you know, as they're delivering the Green Book, but they would also go, he would solicit information from these postal uh, workers. Uh, let me know where the black places are in Missouri, where they are in, you know, in Phoenix, where they are in uh, Boston. So he solicited their, it was like a crowdsourcing, an early form of crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. That's how people 
um, you know, wrote, uh, were able to advertise in the, in the book. So, As the I'm word looking, of, okay, go ahead. Sorry, last, just last one. The, um, then the word of mouth must have been incredible. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, word of mouth is how they, how, um, the migration came about. Right, because, exactly. Uh, yeah, with, um, the, the Chicago Defender, you know, that's how he he did the exact same thing, but he did it with the train and the yeah. ushers. He, you know, passed them out through them and they got that information telling them, hey, come north because the south is not for you. And yeah. he he's credited with like, what, 500,000 people, moving 500,000 people to the, to the north because of the Chicago Defender and word of mouth. Yeah. But, um, we have a lot of people up here that are talking about the fact that they it actually are digital green books per se mm -hmm. um, sending out they got a lot of links up here talking about something in Asheville it's like just little little links of different places of where you can go so this is this is really nice thank you guys for for posting all of this um Renette says that they have a black business guide that is published here every year and um sherry tolliver has shared a link so this is this is really awesome that all of this is up here i did not know that they actually have one it's awesome that you guys are sharing it but it's kind of sad that it's actually happening again <laughs> when you when you think about it that we actually have to have this happening again it, it actually is happening well, I think, one of, I think one of the things about these new uh, links, digital digital links to Black businesses, is not just uh, about, you know, this is where you go to feel safe. It's like, let's support Black business. It's more positive than, than that. And I think that's okay. what we're seeing. We're seeing it in, yeah, in different communities, in different cities. I want to know if I want to go out, you know, where I want to spend my, my money, you know, um, yeah, and even now, uh, post this, you know, this summer and this racial reconciliation, you can go to like Uber Eats and they'll have a thing about black restaurants, yep. black owned restaurants. I appreciate that, you know. But you know, they didn't start doing that until the George Floyd situation. Exactly, that's what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't, no, no, totally. Matter of fact, they didn't start doing that. Netflix didn't start having a no. black film area. I mean, yep. all of that stuff didn't come up until after the George Floyd situation yep. and, and everything. So that, that happened because of that now. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 yeah, that, yeah. But there I, definitely I were, that it, before that, that. The, there were, we had it in Brooklyn, uh, where I am, you know, a link to the black businesses. This is, you know, a few years ago, I started seeing this link of, you know, to bl the black businesses. Um, and it's everything from wine stores to butchers to, you know, and I love that. So that kind of stuff I think is like, how do we support uh, black businesses um, is, is super important. And let's not forget banks. There's been a real resurrection oh in, in the rebirth of black banks. Yeah. Major. Yeah. So um, one person asked the question and said something about, uh, was there a chain of gas stations at um, SO, what did it say? Yes. yes. SO that had them available. And the thing is, is that SO Bank, the SO Oil was actually uh, in the documentary and they were hiring a lot of African-Americans. And as a matter of fact, they were, according to the documentary, they were, they, they hired their first, mar their marketing people were African-Americans and they, right. all, they put right. them at the table. And, yeah. and it, yeah. it, 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 you know, it showed, it showed the, the, I can't think of the word that I'm trying to say, but it showed the, the, what is the word that I'm trying to think of? It, it, it showed what it does to have us at the table. Absolutely. And SO, the story of SO is really interesting. SO was uh, Rockefeller. Uh, so that was Rockefeller Oil. Um, and Rockefeller, he was married to a woman, I forget her first name, but her last name was Spellman. And she was, her family came from a minor abolitionist. They started Spellman College. So there was a long history of, um, excuse me, of progressive philanthropy um, that was through the Rockefellers that we still see up until today. And Esso, uh, was, as you said, one of the first 
um, their company was one of the first companies to hire black scientists, um, black marketing people, and they had green books available in their, at their gas stations. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It is 4.55. Yeah. Good conversation though. This was awesome. I am so, I'm so glad we were able to talk to you and we do want you back on the show. Definitely. For sure. I hope we can make that happen. So you have another, let, let's briefly talk about that. You have another um, documentary that you're doing. Tell us about that. Yes, I have a film that's coming out this year, despite the terribleness of it, has been a very busy year. Um, I had a film that came out, two films that came out in September, one uh, about Harry Belafonte and The Tonight Show, which is streaming on Peacock, the Peacock Network. And then I did a film uh, for the New York Times about the Breonna Taylor uh, murder and investigation, uh, which is streaming on FX and Hulu. Um, so, uh, so that's in September. And then this film that I've been working on for many years is finally coming out on American Masters, uh, PBS's American Masters. It's called How It Feels to Be Free. And it's about six trailblazing African-American female entertainers and how they reshaped representation for Black women uh, in their particular time period and their field and how that set up uh, the sort of renaissance of Black storytelling that we're seeing today. And the women are uh, Lena Horne, Nina Simone, Diane Carroll, Abby Lincoln, Cicely Tyson, and Pam Greer. So guess what? That's what, what we want you back on the show for. <laughs> <laughs> and we're related to Diane Carroll. How are you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> How are you related to Car Diane Carroll and Lena Horne? Well, we, we connect to them. Um, okay. In Edgeville, South Carolina, we connect to, ah. both, to both of them in that. And they, we have in there. Oh, yeah. awesome, awesome. Well, it's on January 18th. It's 9 p.m. Eastern time, Eastern time. It'll be streaming for like 30 days after that. But please, please check out the film. And there's but, a link to it in the comment section of this video. But we'll be, we'll be posting more about it later on. Yes. yes, and we also, and I saw that someone asked about the, um, about this particular documentary, about the Negro motorist. That's also already in the comments, am I right? Yes, the link for this yeah. that's already in the comments but we will um post it again when it's reposted on the on demand Actually, so we want to thank you it's one of the first it's amongst the, the the first comments so it should be right at the top yeah right at the top but mm -hmm. you're stay on and um but we want to thank you don't close out but we, i do want to thank you for getting on with us and um, this was awesome. This was an awesome conversation. And we would love to have you back maybe around Women's History Month to talk about that, your, that show. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, guys. So thank you for, for spending this hour with us. Um, I'm sure the audience got a lot out of it. Audience at home, thank you, as, as always, for uh, spending our hour with us. We, we always appreciate having you here. And we, we love having your comments and your questions. And please do join us next week, Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when we speak with Carmelotta Williams from the Black Archives of Mid-America. Yes, we're going to learn some new stuff, new resources. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're finally busting out of the East Co our East Coast genealogy and giving you <laughs> mid Midwest genealogy. Yes, we need some Midwest stuff. <laughs> so until next week, have a blessed and happy New Year's. Um, stay safe wear a mask, and looking forward to seeing you next week at 4 o'clock. Yes, bye for now. Bye. Bye.